Like I don't remember like when I when I first the second day I came home from hospital. I remember getting a bath when you were a wee baby. Mm -hmm. You have a deadly memory. That's class, mm -hmm. unreal. Brian, what do you remember? Anything from way back when? It's so tricky because you can't remember. I can't remember what I'm remembering is a memory or sort of like a bifurcated memory from photographs and what have you. But some of the first things that jump in on my head are being up at Castle Ward. Um, my grandpa had a boathouse there. Um, I'm being in the car, my grandpa's old car. Um, and then the other fond memory I have is like, my dad had a great social life until I was like six or seven, it felt like. Um, just been around, you know, when you're, when, basically when I was Henry's age and a bit younger, the sort of atmosphere of, of, of men being together and drinking and smoking. <laughs> and uh, that's still part of my life because I smoke cigars usually once a week. And um, all the men back then smoke pipes and cigars yeah. and cigarettes and uh, rollies and what have you. So it's quite colourful growing up in there. Uh, 90, 1990, 91, 92, that sort of age. That's cool. <laughs> Whereabouts did you grow up? Where was home for you? Uh, I grew up uh, just around the corner from Stranmellis Primary School, which is pretty well known in Belfast, I feel, near the Lagan Meadows. Mm. Just in a little, uh, uh, just a little re regular semi detached house. We were very lucky. We had a huge abandoned garden behind us, and then also the Osborne playing fields that is the home of Inst, uh, the big school in Belfast. So, and then you had Lagan Meadows, like I said. So, we had some fun building huts and what have you. That's cool, awesome. So, if you've just jumped in to listen, uh, hello and welcome. We are finally out of the garden shed again. We are uh, no more remote interviews, thank goodness. And uh, we've got an absolutely class, yeah, class uh, setting and a class uh, surrounding for this episode. Henry, could you describe, because obviously there's no cameras, could you describe, like for the people listening, the room around us and kind of what's here and, and what we're looking at? Even what you're doing, that's really interesting. Yeah, well, what I'm drawing right now is the BFG in the Queen's. <laughs> It's amazing. I'm surrounded by art. I mean, there's jaw box bottles on the wall. There's um, gin everywhere. Dad, and my dad right here is doing like paintings for like the auction here. Wow. I know this is about this. Is, the, it's in city centre. That's right. Montgomery Street, isn't it, or just mm -hmm. off May Street? Um. Yeah. Ross's auction is Montgomery Street. Yeah. So big auction house. Uh, in this amazing studio space of. Brian John Spencer, class Belfast artist, amazing guy, doing some really, really interesting work, doing some really interesting things. And uh, we're joined with his son, Henry. What's your middle name? Probably Brian, is it, Henry? Yeah, Henry yeah. Brian Spencer. How old are you, Henry? Um, seven. And how old's your dad? 32. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> Good one. Well in there, lad. Class. Uh, so, yeah, we're having a very kind of chilled out, very relaxed conversation here i feel way out of my depth here i'm just sitting here with my wee pen and a blank page for any notes for the the interview henry's over here drawing the bfg and brian is in full sketch mode uh doing a portrait of myself while uh we're doing this interview so yeah feeling like i need to be on my best behavior but super excited to be here and super excited to find out more about these guys stories if if, if i can say so um if you are wondering what it looks like, there's a great photo of Picasso um, sitting in a studio and it's like a big cavernous studio with huge big walls and just canvases everywhere. And you're not supposed to speak highly of yourself or too highly of yourself, especially from this part of the world. But yeah, it's, I'm trying, we're going for that sort of vibe. Totally, man. Yeah, and we've got the, the Harlan and Wolf logo up here. We've got photos of uh, Seamus Heaney and Van the Man and all sorts of guys. So awesome. Brian, I suppose I'd love to find out, just to kind of start, how did you get into art? And was art a big part of your childhood, or when did you kind of start to develop the the confidence to really pursue that? Feel um, free to jump in any time, by the way. We're, we're, we're not too polite on the show, so work away. <laughs> Henry knows the answer? Yeah. What? 
So he saw some people like drawing and he it just made you want to do it. Yeah. It just yeah. gives you that feeling. Yeah. In your body, like it just makes you want to do it. Like how I got into art because I saw you in like the dining room drawing or something. Yeah. And it just made me do it as well. Yeah. Yeah, that's Henry summed it up pretty well. Um, but it, it was also because my mum was just so inten- into it and really intense with it. It was just part of her. Like when our first dog died, she that day got out of canvas and got the dog to lie in the canvas and then she made like a collage drawing out of it. Wow. Um, she, even before she had me, she went to painting holidays. She would go and... Life drawing classes, um, the famous Bill Gatt. So I've inherited, obviously, through her, the genetics of it, and then also just being around her. Um, and then just the other thing is, I suppose, what Henry was alluding to, just seeing art, like uh, the work of uh, Roel Friars, who uh, he painted right throughout the 60s, 70s, 80s, Anyone above 40 in Northern Ireland will know who he is. Anyone our sort of age in their 30s and down wouldn't. And seeing his work, it, it, it's like listening to the bagpipes or good music. It would just like resonate with, within me and my dire fam. And, and then it would make me want to do it. So just seeing good art makes you want to do it. And I've always wanted it. But as I was maybe saying to you earlier, being a grammar school boy, you were told not to do that. So it's been a long route where I sort of, it was on ice for a good number of years. Yeah, and was there like a particular moment or a particular thing that uh, helped you kind of break out of that grammar school mindset, I suppose? Because yeah. that's flipping hard to get out of. <laughs> yeah, sometimes like I'm sort of haunted by it, that it took me until I was like 25 to get become an artist. But then again, I'm grateful, that, you know, I'm very aware that some people never get to live their hobby and their dream. Uh, but yeah, there was a big bang moment actually. Um, so I studied law at university from like 2006 to 2010, 11. So that's a bad time to graduate, <laughs> the financial crisis. So 2011, 12, 13, even 14 were kind of my like wilderness years or twilight years, whatever you want to call it. Um, it was quite tricky. I was doing everyone from, I remember I tried to get jobs in law. I did a health to wealth course with Princess Trust. Um, I tried to start my own social media for law firms um, thing. I tried to do copywriting, did a little bit of copywriting, found it very, very difficult. I um, was doing rugby coaching, found that very difficult, trying to coach under 15 boys of a ball and a hinge. It's like trying to herd cats. <laughs> um, and I actually, one Saturday afternoon, after coaching up a ball and a hinge, um, I remember sitting in my my studio, which was my room in Stramillis then, and doing a quick drawing of Michael Dean. Um, and then put it on my Twitter. And then on Sunday morning, when I was actually at the Austria Museum at the art, in the art zone, I got a DM from Michael Dean. I was like, oh, it's Michael Dean. The, wow. The, <laughs> yeah, yeah, the Michelin star restaurateur and kind of like just pushed away of Belfast and just synonymous with Belfast and one of those characters that makes Belfast what it is. So that alone was just like, oh my word. And this is one of, it's probably just one of the biggest moments of my life after, you know, just short, just short of the day Henry was born. I'm not happy. <laughs> but um, Michael Dean said, look, I'm looking to create a, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm creating a wine. I need a label. Can I use your art? And I was just like flabbergasted. Um, and, you know, you know, everyone's drawn, everyone's made a drawing. But to actually then go do a drawing and somewhere, someone to offer money for it mm. and to offer to put it on a wine label, it's very hard to describe how that feels. So that just was a big bang moment, as I said, for me. And it made me see that I can make money out of art. I can make my art go places. Um, so, yeah, it was a big That's awesome. moment. What are some of your thoughts? Like, I know we've talked about this before, but kind of this whole you know the commerce side the art and you obviously have like one camp that is all about art and you just you know you you have to pursue your romantic notion and do whatever you want and you know paint the paintings that you want to paint how do you kind of walk the line between that your own creative interests and uh, the reality that we all live in of hey bro i have to pay my rent (laughs) yeah there's like a a, a sort of tension or standoff between there's this idea that 
the artist is some romantic spendthrift penniless figure who generates art from the depths of their soul by some sort of crazy alchemy <laughs> I don't know but um, you know that you sit in your little cottage out in Wicklow or wherever or <laughs> yeah that's all it and, and you're like Seamus Heaney getting that cottage and going and, yeah. and writing poetry the rest of your yeah. life yeah Yeats and his be like Blade you know <laughs> um, and it comes out and it's finished very quickly and it becomes a cultural icon and St. Ulster Museum and 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 the Royal Hibernian Society and <laughs> in, in the museum and yeah the Louvre's calling you on the phone they're like yeah. right what space has just opened up <laughs> yeah yeah or, or even you, you don't have to go that far some of those fancy museums in uh, in in Dublin but the, but for me I, I I don't get tied up in that um, romanticism and I'm very quite aware of some artists that are sort of spend days and weeks even months on a piece of art whereas I've always been very focused maybe because of being a grammar school boy maybe having been in law and experienced a bit of law and being around lawyers and whatnot and then also having feed at the fire with a, a, a child and a wife and a family that I, I needed to generate money so my, my theory was always a sort of you know high volume mm. high, but you know decent quality art at a high volume and a low affordable cost yeah so I, I was doing my own art that interests me quite often either people People will commission it, their own portrait, or their father's, or what have you. Um, father's Day portrait is quite popular, or they would have their maybe their pet, or their or, or, or a landmark, and that's kind of how I started off drawing well-known faces or well-known places. People will buy it. Remember starting off very simple, you know, maybe twenty pound, thirty pound, forty pound for a commission. Um, you know, it's 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 a nice nice price point. People aren't spending a huge amount of money, and it's then they're not a fan. Then, if it's not amazing, they're not totally against it, and you're okay with it. You know, because as a, you got to be realistic. When you're starting out, you're not going to create the best stuff, um, and then you just build up from there. Um, and yeah, I, 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 I was sort of spur against the the idea that you have to be a, a penniless artist. Um, and my, my rebuttal, usual rebuttal, is just you have to look at the the Louvre it's, itself. I think a lot of the stuff in that was actually commissioned by. Was, was commissioned by the, the yeah, Europe, yeah. European royalty then. You know, the, I don't know, the Velasquez. But, uh, you know, Velasquez was patronized by the Spanish royal family and he was just basically housed by them and painted for them and was looked after lavishly. Um, so he certainly wasn't some sort totally. of um, uh, guy sitting in a... In a, in a apparently, uh, um, Yates would have, done, would have done that like 100 years ago, just... Him and Ford, Maddox Ford or something, just sat in a, an old stone cottage. Wow. Imagine doing that. But, but Velasquez certainly wasn't doing <laughs> yeah, that. Yeah. yeah, he would be drinking the cream. <laughs> yeah, yeah. because <laughs> yeah, even those guys, you know, like, you think of, like, the like the really big, like, you know, archetype artists of, like, you know, Da Vinci and Michelangelo. And they were bankrolled by the Medici family. They were bankrolled yeah. by, you know, bankers, essentially. yeah. yeah. Mental. So that kind of just smashes that whole myth of the yeah. of this romantic artist. Yeah. Something I really like about your story is you always had that kind of, uh, I'm going to say, I hate these words, but they're only words that are coming to mind right now. Like that kind of hustle, that grind sort of approach. And, you know, I love like all of the different services that you've offered over the years from the caricatures and even the way that you've handled that kind of side of your business of, you know, you'll do weddings, you'll do corporate events. And, uh, you know, like you said, you, you're doing high volume, but you're almost getting paid to practice in some Holy ways. Yeah, you stole the words from my mouth. Um, yeah. Um, like, for example, something came up recently where I actually can't tell you what it was. It was a big, uh, big old project. And you can say ass, it's okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> a big project. Very esteemed, distinguished. Hopefully I can divulge it in a few years to come. Nice. But it wasn't... I'm doing a podcast now. <laughs> yeah. You can have a look. Um, so it was a very esteemed uh, commission. It was really pushing the boat out for me and gonna, really going to stretch me. One of those things where you could, you know, in sporting terms, you could maybe pull your hamstring and do yourself some damage even yeah. trying it. But if you pulled off... It's one of those ones where you've got to stretch yourself to for, continue to develop. And it took months to produce. 
But I, I think I charge like very, very little money for it. So you could look at, oh, you're being paid all this. You're being paid no money to do something. You spend so much time when you're already getting any money. But no, you have to, I was looking at it, I was getting paid to practice and push mm-hmm. out. And it allows me to hedge my bets. You know, if it's not that they won't be happy with it, but if, if it's not exactly what they expected, well, they weren't paying huge money for it. If anything, they kind of got it for a steal. Yeah. So, yeah, I would, I would, that's, that's a big part of fa- the growth of an artist. And I would, uh, uh, advice I would pass on. Like I remember speaking to someone and they were telling me that they're, 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 I don't even say son or daughter, just their, um, their, their offspring had fallen out with a friend because they'd done a painting of them and they were disagreeing over the price. And I was like, well, you know, it's just at this stage, you know, it's, you, you probably, you, you can't charge crazy money. So sure. Yeah. That's, that's, that's something you gotta be quite conscious of when you're, when, when, when you're starting out. But um, it's not something you can you can li- li- you don't live by that. But that's yeah. just that's just a plank when you, when when you're getting established. Yeah, that wasn't your dad, was it? What with the what? That guy now. Oh no no! I was like, mate, it'd be unreal if your dad walked in here. <laughs> I'd be like, make it the three generations on. <laughs> <laughs> no. Mate, Henry, you're finished, lad. Look at that. That's epic. I think you're nearly as fast as your dad. That was lightning. No. I- I don't know how much you know about, well, you, you think my art's good, so obviously you know, you do know something about art. <laughs> but um, you don't need to be a novice to know that that's very adept, the way he's got the skin tone. Totally. He has. You know, he's make, he hasn't put, put that over tube. He's mixed uh, the primary colors to, to create the skin tone. So, yeah, something really fascinating to watch Henry develop and grow, that he can just sit there with his own wee, was it Dale O'Reilly? So if you ever want to make the watercolours, you use white, red and yellow and a little bit of blue. That's for skin tone, yeah. Yeah. And what, why blue? Because if I'm so I'm not an artist. I don't know if you can tell that by now. I do I do have white paint on me, but that's just from painting the bathroom. Um, why blue? Because I'd never think to put blue for skin. Just to make it look more realistic. You know? Ah. If you don't have the blue, it kind of looks sort of synthetic and straight from the tube. Mm-hmm. But there is actually there is actually blue in your face. You know what tubes are? That you it looks like it's like it looks like it's um what it looks like it's acrylic, but it's actually mm. um it's actually watercolor. You yeah. Put, you put it on like that, and then just it just like it looks like it's a massive blob or something. Like <laughs> acrylics is all like white, it, like all flat like this. Like that was yeah. That was um this hair was. He's talking about well, most artists wouldn't. You wouldn't know what half pan. It's just like the little watercolors and the wee squares. That's crazy out of a tube. So that's that's the level Henry's at there. Mate, your next level. That's where you are at. Mm-hmm. So how much Henry have you learned from your dad and, and being in the studio, especially now because you're not in, in school full time. You know you just get to spend well, a lot more time here, don't you? In my schoolwork at my house with my mom most of the time, and I just come here at like one o'clock. It's cool. You can hold the mic if you want. You can pick it up now. You're done. You can sit down and chill out. You've got your uh, bespoke orange cover on it. Yeah. <laughs> so what's it like as a, a seven-year-old to come here in the afternoons and hang out and just make art? Well, it is fab. Like, I just love it. Last time it hit when, I, when he didn't work here, I did draw. I used to just... He hated. He went when this office, like, what what was it called? <laughs> yeah, I just worked in an so office. We'll not called, say where, for goodness' sake. He, <laughs> he, he worked in an office. So he did, mm. and he just thought that was so boring. And he just thought I could be an artist. It was, it would be cool. That's and awesome. He just turned into an artist. He just turned into it. What did that look like? Was it like a, a caterpillar turned into a butterfly, or what did it look uh, like? <laughs> he just like thought that like he was gonna just like he was like I would just turn into I'll just turn into um, an artist because I'll be a better job that's awesome what do you think you'll turn into whenever you're older I don't know might be a tattoo artist or might be a normal artist I never know cool and uh, tell me a bit about, you say you like Quentin Blake? 
Mm-hmm. Why do you like him? Just because I like all his drawings and it just made me do his drawings. That's like. cool. What's your favourite Quentin Blake thing to draw? Probably this one here. Yeah, the one you just drawn? Yeah. Why do you like the BFG? Trust it's very cool and the movie that Steven Spielberg made is really the graphics in it are amazing and all. I didn't know Flippin' Spielberg made that. He did, yeah. That's cool. Steven Spielberg has made movies for over 30 years. 30 years? Mm-hmm. Wow. But you didn't learn that in school, did you? No. <laughs> I just knew that. He made Jurassic Park and Jaws and all and stuff like that. Jurassic World. Really? Mm-hmm. I see you're sitting beside a projector here. Do you think you'll maybe have a movie night some night here? Well, yeah, sort of. <laughs> What other sort of things do you learn around here, hanging out with your dad? Well, I would sort of work for them, sometimes take boxes for them down and all. Oh, yeah? Yeah. You're like a, an apprentice assistant extraordinaire, are you? Yeah. It's probably about right. And they pay you in sparkling water? There's a lot of sparkling water around here. <laughs> Oh, that's more my dad's money. <laughs> <laughs> I think, um, like, it's funny because here, you know, we're in the top floor, but there's a fully fledged, fully operational auction house that sells like 5,000 pieces of art a year. Poof. You know, it's heavy going. There's a monthly uh, auction for jewelry, monthly auction for art, and then a weekly auction for like just stuff around your house, quite often like estate sales and what have you. So there's a huge amount of stuff coming and going. Um, just before the lockdown, for example, they brought like piles and piles of boxes. The yeah. boxes cost like four point each, you know, the big massive ones. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I had to bring them up a couple of flights of stairs. So I, I, guess, I don't know if this is child abuse, but um, I, know, I, I just I thought like it'd be. Just... <laughs> I thought it'd be a good lesson. Saying, look, Henry, I, I, he got he got like ten pound for doing it. Were, yeah, but it did get like twenty up or. Look, I didn't pull out the whip or the the the, <laughs> the, the, the riding crop or whatever, but it just had him these huge big boxes. Like he had his arms as wide as it could go and he's wow. carrying them up the stairs. But it's, I just thought, you know, it's something that he'll never forget. It'll be very re- rewarding. Um, but please, well, you know where to go to if if you disagree. Is it the RSPCA or something? <laughs> yeah. NSPCC. <laughs> What's the one that's for dogs? I always forget, and then I always end up saying the wrong one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there's a bird one, the child one, and the dog one. So, um, any of them will help. Yeah, but I think um, you know, I, I, um, our mutual friend was saying he really appreciated some of the stories I was putting on Instagram of working with Henry. Um, and I'm sending it to my wife, and she was saying like, "Oh, well, sure, that time we were at the Ulster American." folk park and it's funny I remember when Henry was there about two or three, three even three or four years ago and he's seven now we were in that one everyone's been there we were in the wee cottage and the guy's sitting making a what, yeah, like a soda that? bread or something on the griddle no no no, no the blacksmith oh and he's yeah he's into the the, the, the the fork yeah. into the heat and then yeah. taking out put it in the water and he had Henry hold it and he wow. said look 200 years ago or whatever you would have just started off in his apprentice Um, so that fascinates me, you know, not child labor, but there's different ways of looking at things. And just because it is the way it is doesn't mean it has to be the way it is. Mm. Um, and certainly Henry's standing in the system. He's going to be going to school. But also I'm going to teach him how to paint. I'm going to show him how to cut glass and frame and whatnot. Um, yeah, he's already teaching me how to cut glass. I'm st- he, I'm already holding it and just like fingering it, but it just when you use the wee thing to tap it and make it come off, it's just sort of hard to like make all the like it sort of like smash like that big line. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah so uh, well, he, you know, I, I don't cut glass as much as I used to, but when I would have been doing that, I would have shown Henry just just so he knows. And in a few years' time, maybe if he wants to do that, or if he can help me out. It's cool. So, but it's like that kind of like back in the day. You would have like learned your dad's craft, and you would have been probably like apprenticing from a young age. Yeah. You've got the wee cap and all, Henry. You look like you could just go work on yeah. the shipyard or something. <laughs> yeah, a barber hat. Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. That's Henry right. Loves his barber hats. Unreal. Don't you? Yeah, and Supreme as well. Yeah, Supreme. <laughs> Snazzy. I ha- I've only got like one or two Supreme hats. Only one or two. I prefer the brand Spencer. It's a better version <laughs> of Supreme. And barber jackets I've got. Why do you like barber so much? 
He's just going to an anxious movie. Well, let me know. Yeah. No, no, no. Tell the fool. What, what, what's your favorite? Where were we this morning? What was it? So we went and got the dog spayed. And yeah. then we went. Oh, per dog. I know. Oh. And, then, and then what shop did we go to? Oh, the Charlie shop. Were you thrifting? Mm-hmm. Oh, Henry loves thrifting. Oh, unreal. Thrifting. That's where you got that barber hat, wasn't it? Charity shop. Yeah, not nice. that charity shop though. It was a different one, wasn't it? It was that Port one. Rush. Was Port it Port Rush? Rush? Yeah. How much yeah. did you pay for it? But now th- this was an import rush. That it was. was. It I was hundred percent Port Rush. I'm hundred percent. It was. N- Remember that time we went to SD Bells and then we drove up there and then. There was like a hat, a barber hat there. No. Or was it that with those you, white shoes? That's where you got a barber jacket. Oh, that's where I got the barber jacket? Yeah. So. How much roughly do you think you paid for the hat? Well, about £2.3. I don't know. Here. That's, uh, that's worth carrying a few boxes up the stairs, I reckon. You could buy like three or four new barber hats with that sort of money. <laughs> <laughs> no, I just save it and all. It's cool. Do you enjoy school? Well, sort of, yeah. <laughs> Is there, tell me something that you, you like learning in school. I like learning about verbs. About verbs? Yeah. Do you like words? Do you like learning, you know, about English and stories and things like that? Um, yeah, I like stories. It's cool. And any other Roald Dahl books that you like? Yeah, I read Roald Dahl books. I read, like... The James and John Peach and oh, the yeah. BFJ and Billy and the Mimpins. If you could be one Roald Dahl character, which one would you want to be? Well, I don't know, but... Seriously, I like all the Roald Dahl books in place, Mr. Twit? Mr. Twit, yeah, With the like big that. beard? Yeah. <laughs> and what is it, like the scrambled egg stuck inside yeah. the beard? Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's minging. <laughs> and him with the, like, wait, the wee paint pot or something. <laughs> I'd draw him with it, like him and a dad. Yeah, that's cool. good. Do you think you'd rather be the person that does the pictures for the books or writes the words for the books? Um, the words are the pictures. I probably love the pictures more. Mm. Well, mate, your, your BFG drawn here's class. You could definitely, definitely have a go at that for sure. Yeah. I know. It's awesome. It is cool in here. It's cozy and comfortable, like. Yeah. And you've got so much space, and I think as well for what you do, so much light. Yeah. It it is a little tricky. Um, but it isn't always light here. No. Yesterday, when or this morning actually in Belfast, before we had the rain, it was like we're in a cloud. Mm. It was almost like it was like ten o'clock at night. Wow. So it's tricky then. But uh, it's handy because the width, of, the length or width of the room. Um, if you're sitting in two direct sunlight, we'll give you a migraine, so you can move over to the corner in the height of the sun. It's cool. And then move towards the window, and then later on in the day. And then I don't have it in this room, but you can get like daylight lights, mm. huge big bit lights you get in the supermarkets. So yeah. you get that. So you get sorted with that. That's cool. But, I um, I'm curious to know if there's any other ways. That your kind of legal profession or your, you know, your training as a lawyer has kind of helped or influenced your art? Um, just maybe how I approach it. I don't think, like, I'm not ruthless. Like, I'm, I'm not that great. I, think, I feel like I'm a bit of a soft touch with selling and talking about money and stuff. Um, but at the same time, I'm not completely afloat at that with that. So just the little things like being organized, um, knowing that you can't spend days and weeks on a piece of art. Um, yeah, and just being practical, having been to grammar school, having played rugby at a high level, you know, all the discipline, rigor that, yeah, that rugby and law and academics teaches you applies to my the art. Um, then the other thing would be, obviously, for a long time, you know, art, um, lawyers have been sort of subject of art, whether it be like the trial of Roger Casement, which is a great painting by Sir John Lavery, or uh, the old Vanity Fair portraits of uh, like the old high court judges and politicians, which is kind of the way my portraits mm. look. That sort of standing at three quarters, full body, sort of looking poised and elegant. 
but like the way you do now, the way or the way your portrait's coming along. <laughs> um, has there been any? You know, you mentioned John Lavery there. Um, what do you know about him? Because he's only a character that I've started to find more about recently. Like to be honest, I didn't even know he existed until like a uh, year ago. <laughs> how did you come up on him? Uh, the blue plaque. All oh, right. Okay. There's a wee blue plaque on I think St Paddy's Church in the Cathedral Quarter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, that's like, we're awful bad at that. Not um, you know, if you go on to YouTube, I love watching artist documentaries. You know, you've got Picasso, Matisse, Van Van Gogh, but there's very little for the Irish artists, and there's no end of them. So that's a real deficit that we can address. Um, the Ulster Museum is a great cheerleader for the man, um, but yeah, apart from that, you could easily miss him. Um, I came upon him uh, fairly recently. It's like, like I haven't known him when I was a kid. Didn't know him when I was a kid, but he, he's a sort of towering figure of Irish art in yeah. the 1900s. You know, he painted all the, the politicians that sort of created this island that we we've lived on uh, for the last hundred years. Um, he painted scenes. He painted. He, he lived over in Morocco in Tangier. Um, he painted uh, horse riding um, uh, scenes, horse racing scenes. Uh, uh, he painted scenes from the First World War. Um, painted ladies, he painted men. Um, I've done a reproduction in there, actually. It was fun. In 2017, I spent a whole day in the Ulster Museum just doing a reproduction of his painting that was made in 1917. So wow. it was 100 years to the day. A centenary or whatever you call it. Yeah. The, so it was like there was a, a dog fight in the air and there was a woman looking out um, out her window in, in London. So, and, and that, that exercise is a bit like, you know, a young guitarist, um, young musician, you know, they, 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 mm. they learn the greats. They, they play Jimi Hendrix or whoever it is to get inside, walk in their shoes. And totally, see how yeah. You master whatever language it is you're speaking. Yeah. I, uh, my way of relating to that, because like I said, you know, I'm not a visual guy. Uh, I've heard of writers, you know, there's one writer in particular and he, uh, he sat down at a typewriter and he typed out all of the great Gatsby. Yeah. And when someone <laughs> asked him why, he says, I just wanted to know what it felt like to write something good. <laughs> See, you need to go to the toilet? Yeah. Work just away. Go, just set it down. You're fine. Yeah, yeah. It'll be, it'll be waiting for you whenever you come back. <laughs> yeah, actually, the, the article, for, I don't know why, like, um, I spent, anyway, I don't know why, but somehow the Times the, in down south, the Southern Edition, got in touch with me and did a feature on that. About, because, and the reason why I did it was not only because it was a centenary, but there was an exhibition on it that period called The Artist is Thief. So it was talking about ah. how Lavery himself was influenced by some of the great masters yeah, yeah, yeah. who have you European painters, portrait painters. Well, I mean, that's the whole Picasso thing, like uh, amateurs copy and artists steal. Yeah, I think well, that was Picasso. Yeah, that's how well, that's we all speak the same language and we all talk with Belfast accents, you know, so we're all little parts and mimics yeah. in our own wee way. We just don't realize it. There is like, a part of it is, you know, like you said, that was a great analogy used about the guitar player, um, off where you, you are inspired by other people's work and you give it a go. Cause if you look at a, you know, a Matisse painting, it's so radically different to a Lavery painting. And you're like, huh, what the heck's going on there? And it's interesting. Like, you know, even looking around, at your work in this space and you know i'm familiar with your work in the baths as well you seem to be very comfortable experimenting with loads of different styles yeah is there like a particular reason that you uh switch i suppose between those different kind of mediums as well yeah i suppose just having been a sports person you know rugby was my first love I, i know the mechanics of that process and how you get better how you improve and you know any good rugby player or any good athlete knows that you're working with your muscles you got to do upper body one day lower body and then you got to do anaerobic aerobic you got to do high intensity low intensity short duration long duration and it just keeps the muscles thinking and working so if you just sit and do portraits all the time your your, your brain and your muscles um you're going to get you're going to plateau whereas if you do abstract one day and then you do portraits the next, and then you do watercolor one day, and then oils, and then acrylics, and then big paintings, small paintings, and then paintings that are done in an hour, and paintings that are done in a week. A yeah. week. So that's that's just my my method and my way of thinking. And then the the important bit is that each bit like upper body and lower body, and then doing your core work, each instruction informs 
and buttresses and reinforces the other. And you get a nice synchronicity. And you can and suddenly you realize that you work on one of these splashy watercolors and you realize that you've picked that you're implementing something that you learned from the abstract painting. And vice versa that you realize with the abstract painting that you're implementing something that you yeah. picked up for having done the more freestyle watercolor splashy paintings. Totally. And uh whenever you were showing me around you use this great phrase you know you said oh, i was doing loads of stuff like this and then i started to get a little bit stiff so i had to start doing something else yeah talk to me a bit about that yeah well if, if just again you can get in, into a bit of a rut and you can get a feel of yourself getting a wee bit stale you're overthinking it you're not you're losing some of that dynamism so you just gotta walk away from that room or that mate or whatever the rut you're in and just do something completely different and then maybe come back mm. And again, it just keeps you fresh. It's cool. I also know what you need to be a good artist. Like if you if you're a good doctor, you're a good builder or anything, or you wake up early in the morning and you're nice and fit and all and stuff like that. <laughs> That's true. Yeah, I, I think he's paraphrasing something. I say, you know, being a good uh, do- artist is the same as being a good. Uh, builder or, or doctor <laughs> means getting up at six in the morning totally. when you don't want to in the cold and seeing well, that first idea. patient get up at like seven yeah or and six or something and you're going to be a good artist someday or a good builder or a good doctor yeah but and what you're saying about writing there's too many you know for, the analogy I always give you know I don't drink that much but you know I've been hang, I've been hung over and even though it's sound that word brings back memories of like when I've been hungover, I remember when I was living in France, I was so desperately hungover, but I'd said I would cut this guy's grass. <laughs> and I had to get in a van, get picked up, and spent all day cutting this guy's grass. And I just did it. And because you have to, I, I'd, made, I'd, made, I'd made the commitment that said I would, so, and I needed the money, so I had to. And it's, it reminds me of a barista. And I'd get my coffee, and I would chat away to him. And he said, oh, I'm awfully hungover today. And, you know, he's a sweet sitting there from 6, 7 in the morning, doing his co- coffees one person after another after another yeah. he doesn't have time to think oh i've got barista block he just <laughs> has to, you know his employer is paying him yeah there there's a lot to be said about what henry was saying yeah being a good artist is like being a good barista well that's it and it's back to what you were saying at the start about you know the the artist who is commercially aware you know that if you're a plumber, you can't afford to get plumber's block. Mm. So why should you have the luxury or the privilege to to just take time off as a, a creative? Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I don't, so I never I never got that. And like, was it is it Trey Parker, the, the South Park Boys? They 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 turn they they um you know they produce an, a, a whole season and in, in, in the length of time it takes others like The Simpsons to create one episode. It's crazy. And I think they said that they were like writer's block is BS. Yeah, it's just something. It's a wee BS myth that some people allow themselves to buy into yeah of course there are days when it does apply but by and large it's it's something you can maybe pull out once a month Mm. yeah that's right yeah you you have your your uh creative block card and you only get one of them every month yeah yeah yeah. (laughs) but that's the same you know even if you are if you're a lawyer you're a builder like there's days where you're wrecked and you can't be bothered picking the brick up and um you know we all kind of have days like that henry um so whenever your mates ask you, what does your dad do for a living, or what's your dad's job? What do you tell them? Tell them that like he's an he's an artist and all, and I'm a really good artist and I'm good at collect like, quite a lot of things. I'm good at boxing and good at like, oh, yeah? all sport. What type of sport do you like? Probably block boxing or something. Box. I don't really like boxing. Cause you like rugby, don't you? Not really. <laughs> <laughs> Look at those guns. Flip me. Your guns are bigger than mine, I think. Sweet biceps. You can do with the push-ups. How many push-ups do you think you can do? Six. Flip me. You need to, come on, man, you need to get up to seven. Then you do one for every year that you've been alive. That'd be cool. Mm-hmm. Get, you need to get your reps in now, too. <laughs> yeah. Talk to me about uh, Brooklyn. I only found out uh, recently that you... Spend quite a bit of time and oh, he's doing the push ups. Go for it. Right, one good form. He's got good form, yeah. Yeah, two perfect. Mate, your form's unbelievable. Here's a third. Go on, son. Yes, there's the fourth. 
Go on. Go on. Go on. Yes. <laughs> oh, builder. Builder. <laughs> yeah. What a monster. One more. Go on. Go on. Go on. <laughs> yes. Mid. You killed it. Destroyed it. That's why your guns are big. You're banging their apps out like that. Whew. You need some sparkling water after that, I think, big man. <laughs> uh, yeah, so my wife and I, we lived in Manhattan for three years. Yeah. And uh, it's, a, it's a city that's obviously like, special to us. But what's your, what's your connection to that part of the world? Oh, it's so special. I, I'm always self-conscious not to waffle and just ramble on. But I try to be really quick. So if I go back to that twilight period, yeah, where I didn't know what the heck I was doing in my life, I did have like a six-month internship in New York uh, in the summer of 2011. And how that came about was my mum's sister's husband has like a second or third cousin who's a law firm in Manhattan. Oh, sweet. And Oh, I was so lucky. I got a J1, got that arranged. And then my uncle, my uncle Jim, thank you very much, arranged <laughs> this internship. So I stayed with his cousins, um, Mariana and uh, Mr. Flannery, Seamus. Uh, in Baldwin, Long Island, for three weeks. And that was so cool. You took the Long Island Railroad in the, I think it was Central Station, and then get, walk up to 48th on Park Avenue, just sit in the cubicle for eight, nine hours. And their whole stipulation, uh, Mariana and uh, Seamus, uh, my uncle's cousins in Long Island, was that, look, we've got tons of cousins in Ireland. You only stand three weeks. You're not standing the whole three, six, six months. <laughs> so anyway... Oh, that's terrifying, you know, trying to find somewhere to stay. And yeah. I bumped into this girl on the subway when I was um, trying to get back to Central Station late one Friday night. She was saying, I'm going your way. Um, we, we, got talk, we got talking. Um, I told her I need to find a room. She said she needed to find a roommate. So nice. I could stay. I, so, and now that was critical because if I didn't have somewhere to f- um, stay, even though I had like a six month J1 or what, four month, whatever it was, um, I couldn't have stayed. So that I stayed and just the serendipity and good fortune. So that. good. It was unreal, and it just shows the potential of the city. And n- nothing had ever happened in my life like that, and that's just so encouraging. And then, so, and the place I got to stay, it wasn't like some dumpy place. It was Park Slope, yeah. which is kind of like the nicest place. And it was like, you said Park Slope, yeah, mate. That's unbelievable part of Brooklyn, <laughs> mate. That's that's like farmer market territory. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, like, that's um, to put in I, the the equivalent equivalent I make or the comparison I make. It's kind of like living on. Omer Road currently. Yeah, it is. Yeah, but not just it's got that vibe, but it's even more market. Yeah, it's kind of like it'd be like if Omer Road only had like Whole Foods and Marks and Spencers. Yeah, but it's kind of, <laughs> well, kind of like just Upper Lisbon Road. Yeah, Malone, Malone Road there, but it's somewhere between the three. So stay there. Oh my goodness, just loved it. The evenings were great. I lived with these musicians. I remember the first got to stand at Brownstone. Remember they lived in the, the floor above us. I remember the first night. They're sitting on the stoop and said, hey, guys, how are you doing? Blah, blah, blah. Well, what do you do? And they're like, oh, yeah, we're artists. And I'm like, well, what do you actually do? And they're like, yeah, we're, we're artists. So, again, was that whole process of breaking down my preconceptions and barriers and stereotypes and what have you. So I got to hang out with them. Um, just, so, but, and, then, and then, unfortunately, I had to come home. And, and it was sort of September, October. And I wasn't able to get a job. And I had this longing to always get back. Yeah. And I knew I would get back. I just didn't know when. Um, and then also when I became an artist, full-time artist in 2015-16, it made me want to go back even more because mm. I feel like the time, the six months I had spent there, it wasn't my true self. So I actually got the chance to go back. It was on this like exchange thing where, we got, where we got to go. It was like a young a couple of young politicians, a young uh, civil servant, a young uh, academic, a young banker, and then a young artist. We went for, they give us like a two month visa for going two weeks. It's brilliant. So we did this trip in Washington, D.C., Columbus, Ohio, and then Little Rock, Arkansas. And they all went home. I stayed on New York. Class. With a friend that I made in 2011. And I sort of had a budget for 10 days. And I was like, I'll give it a crack. Um, and to your point, and hung around Park Slope, although I was staying in bed I um, hung around Park Slope during the days, cultivated all the, the network and the friends I had back then. I went to one of these farmer markets and another sort of big bang moment where I'm just this lowly artist from Ireland 
this is the city of artists. Yeah. I'm going to get eaten alive. But I was at this farmer's market, my little stand, um, selling three portraits. And <laughs> holy moly, they just couldn't get enough of it. And not only was I like kept busy the whole day and earned a bit of, you know, a bit of pocket money thrown my way. It was, oh, can you come draw my brownstone? Can you come draw my pet? Wow. So then the whole week was then spent um, doing that. Yeah, so even outside of trading hours, you were yeah. commissioned effectively. Yeah, and then so I spent the whole now I'm speaking the whole the whole weekday the whole the whole of the week doing the week commissions of brownstones and what have you, and then they would pick it up on Saturday and just repeat that. Unbelievable. And then that was 2016, and then it would go every like two, two, two yeah about two times a year, and uh, just pick up where I left. People would get to know me. It would always be at the Grand Army Plaza at the entrance to Prospect Park. On this one little bench doing portraits, um, I still keep in touch with a lot of people there, um, uh, and still get commissions. People still ask me to do stuff. That's unbelievable. So again, it's a bit like that Michael Dean thing. I, I would say I, I can't say, but for Michael Dean, I wouldn't be stand. Sometimes I think, but for Michael Dean, would I be standing here? But for Jerry White, would I be standing here? Yeah. That's another one. But for that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because I, it wasn't that long before that that I was working in an office. Um, certainly wasn't doing law in that office um, so it was another sort of eye opener moment yeah I mean like that serendipity you talk about like uh, it's you know it's totally real and one of the reasons why I love doing the podcast is because you, you start to see all those these wee moments in other people's lives and it kind of encourages you like oh here like this stuff does happen and even the connections even here locally here you know I'm, I'm looking here to you know, painting you've done off the job box gin bottle. I'm looking over the corner there and there's, you know, one you've done of Michael Dean. And then over on the shelf, there's the, the Dino jaw box gin. Yeah. And so it's like all these kind of worlds just colliding and like you getting to be a part of that even. It's cool. But tell me about uh, Jerry White and, you know, how you know him and, and kind of how he plays a role in that kind of origin story of you, you becoming an artist, as Henry said. <laughs> yeah, so... um that's how I came across your, the Best of Bath podcast, actually, through Jerry White putting it on his um, s- social media. Um, and again, Jerry, like Michael, is sort of one of these characters that makes Belfast what it is. Um, and you, J- Jerry never knows him for his job box. Other people, but not so many, would know him that he was a bar manager to John Hewitt for a good number of years. And he, uh, I don't know, I can't remember how it came about and why I chose John Hewitt. But basically, I would go in there, this is 2014, 2013, 14. I think it was every Thursday for a run of about three or four months and just do portraits of the customers. Um, and Jerry would pay me by the pint. <laughs> I'd get a few free pints thrown my way. And now, I must put that in context of like, there's been many other bars where you've been chased out of. Never mind, welcomed in, and so given a platform, and then like need to feel welcome. But then, that, when when you're a penny, when when I was <laughs> when I was a genuine penny, this bomb artist, then getting three or four free pints is yeah, it's like winning the lottery. So <laughs> the the fondness I have in my heart for um Jerry giving me that platform, and I don't know if it can go as far, but for Jerry, I wouldn't be standing here. But certainly the gust. Of wind that he bit mm. my seals uh, is huge. So uh, it's just so cool to be have worked with those guys in their orbit, yeah. following them with their gravity. And then there was an extra special in that latest project um, when Michael Dean and Jerry came together, and Michael wanted to create his own G- Michael Dean gin. So him and Jerry are working together, and so flattered. I think it was like Christmas time. You know, they're having a conversation on Facebook and I'm brought into it. Oh, let's get Brian Spencer to, to, <laughs> to design it. And I'm like, I'd love to. So um, it's just so cool. They, they turn it around very quickly. The guys at Drinksology don't mess about. Um, no, those are serious guys. Like, they, they don't play. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> they're it's unreal. So, it's so cool just to be able to, like, point at it sitting right there, like yeah. the bottle of gin, unopened, um, and look at the art. But it's, it's my art uh, with Michael's name and Jerry's team. Wow. So it's the three of us. Yeah. And uh, But for the corona, there was supposed to be like a launch night and they, they were maybe going to do a video or we feature on that, but mm. um, ho- hopefully they'll pick that up and we'll, that'll happen. Yeah, I hope so. But there is, again, like 
it kind of debunks that whole stereotype of the isolated artist and the artist who is by himself in, in that wee cottage. Whereas I see, you know, the people who are thriving the most creatively are extremely collaborative and invest heavily in relationships and key relationships. And like you said, they, they operate within the orbit. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So, yeah, just, you know, an economy or a community is about relationships, uh, a chemistry of coming together and mixing up and looking out for one another and spotting little special moments and that synchronicity or that serendipity. And, uh, it's yeah. cool. Have you been to New York, Henry? Yeah. What do you think of it? Yeah, it's nice. Brooklyn. It's nice. <laughs> Brooklyn. Mm-hmm. Brooklyn. What, um, what do you like about it? Or what's different to Belfast? Well, it's different. It's just there's more crowds and stuff, and the towns are bigger, and mm. there's more, loads of taxis, and you know it's a like, different. Like London is, there's loads of buses and taxis. Yeah, that's true. In America, yeah. What you, what you get to eat at the farmers market? Um, I got a pickle. I really like. Whoa! <laughs> <laughs> the kosher dill pickle. Mm-hmm. They're not just like the same deal here, but the so they look like the same. Yeah, yeah, they're they're pretty serious about their pickles over there, aren't they? I remember there's this wee place down near Chinatown in the Lower mm-hmm. East Side called the Pickle Guys, mm-hmm. <laughs> and all they sell is pickles. Yeah, and they just have buckets and buckets of yeah. all these random different types of pickles. Yeah, and then they, yeah. they don't even they, like pickled onions and pickled eggs. Yeah, and stuff yeah, like. and then the the pickle weird stuff as well. Like what else were they pickling? Like pickled carrots and <laughs> pickled broccoli and like pickled what you're like are you serious but they get really into it it's good mm-hmm. and then we, we stayed over once i went with my nanny and we stayed over the whole like some um thing we stayed over with this one named robin uh, with my dad yeah and robin's my, my friend who i'd always yeah. stay with mm-hmm. we might do this yes this year but we don't know can't with Corona, but yeah. so sometime soon. Hopefully. Sure. Do you usually go in the summer or the winter, or is there a time you usually go? More home? summers. It's hot, isn't it? It's sort of spring in the autumn. Yeah. When you get a, the heat, you know what? I would like it more in the autumn. It would be nicer. Yeah, because you don't want that heat. Oh, mm-hmm. it's so warm in the summer, and the so you go down into the subway and you feel like you're in an oven. It's so it's warm. Not even funny. It's just. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's mad. Like. I know. And see when we were um, uh, driving to Morocco, um, you know the flame was boiling. Yeah. Like I was like, can you please turn the heat off? <laughs> can someone please open the window? <laughs> yeah. Or like, can someone please turn the heat off? Yeah. Do you enjoy traveling? I was okay. I just looked at photos of my dad's phone or something. I just played a game on and didn't have what, what didn't need Wi-Fi. Yeah, no Wi-Fi on a play in there isn't it? Yeah, or my iPad or something. Oh, for flip's sake, I left my, I left my um, art bag in the car <laughs> with my iPad in it and it was at Morocco the time I re- yeah. recognised. Oh, mental. I know. That was, um, I forgot to say. And I already downloaded stuff for it and I was like, oh my goodness. I know you even prepared. You put all the work in of getting ready for no Wi-Fi and then, well, there's no Wi-Fi, but there's also no iPad, flip's sake. Yeah. But then, like, one of the things that me and Henry do, or we, we, we started, which which we're, which I, well, I'm chuffed with and Henry enjoys, um, uh, you know, so, you see so many kids on iPads and whatnot, and it is challenging whether, you know, whether you're at church or um, a restaurant or an airport or whatever. So we consciously like thought, well, let's get him like an art bag where he's got all his felt tips and crayons and loads of paper and the stuff he's drawn on. So uh, yeah, he forgot at that time, which was unfortunate. But it was interesting when we were at the pool, the, the wee French family, I was like, I thought I was the only person in the whole world that was like, <laughs> it, uh, intuitive enough to do, or you know, me, me and my wife to do something like that. But yeah. they, they, they did that. You know, you know how practical the Germans and the French are. Oh man, yeah. So, uh, my wife's German, so I know all about it. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're, oh, they're just, they're, they're, you know, there's, you know, you know the way. Like you always hear that celebrity saying that, like that they're, 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 they've never grown up. Whereas there's there's child, adult, and then there's 
Germans. <laughs> like, yes, yeah, the, 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 the final evolution. <laughs> <laughs> the Dutch just are the same. Like that's awesome. So I mean, I know this is a really kind of hard question, but um, would you say there's like a theme that runs through your work, even among all your different styles? Is there kind of like a thread that that ties it all together? Yeah, uh, just uh, well, I suppose. I, I'm, I, there's two feelings of like there's a there's a, a relentless um, there's a there's a sort of a, 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 a ominous feeling of like oh my goodness I've just wasted all those years not being an artist but then there's also the relief that I'm actually afforded the time to be an artist mm. so I'm very grateful for that there's that tension um, then the other thing is just trying to improve and document and do stuff that moves people and so I'm guided by the likes of Sir John Lavery. I'm guided by the likes of Colin Davison, who mm. I was listening to on this podcast not that long ago, <laughs> and your man Oliver Jeffers, um, and how he's inspired by Basil Blackshaw. And, you know, there's a Basil Blackshaw type drawn of a horse. Yes, yeah, funny. As soon as I walked in, I was like, oh, and I couldn't remember the man's name because mm. I remember him saying it in the episode. And I was like, oh, that, I wonder if that's got something to do with that. So I'm actually yeah. really glad you brought that up. It's cool. So, yeah, I think because Oliver said, like, that's you like to sit and have dinner with was it yeah. Obama and Basil Black show. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and like all I know is that Basil Black show is just a wild man for uh, the the drink and yeah. having a good time. So uh yeah. So as an artist you're there's these sort of guiding stars, John Lavery, Velasquez, Rembrandt, Rembrandt Basil Blackshaw, Colin Davison. Yeah. So you're just trying to get in the mix of them. That's, those are my themes of just trying to make something uh, notable mm. um, you know like those Colin Davison head studies like, there's some I've sort of done copies over there there's like a copy of the Michael Longley one a copy of the Seamus Heaney one because I want to feel what it feels like for him to do that the Michael Dean character is kind of like a rip off of the Oliver Jeffers about a boy or with a boy yeah. character it's cool and a lot of your work is very much rooted in place yeah I suppose for years I, I spurned the 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 the, the, the what, what's the word the creams the, the damn creams <laughs> because I've seen every bloody painter amateur or professional paints the creams and I was like I'm never painting the creams. Yeah, if anyone sets up like a an Etsy art business, the first product is always like a crane, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's the go to. But I like to think that mine's sort of like a way that no one's ever done it. So yeah, I'm all about drawing the local landscape. And then the local people, the faces. If you could put a number on how many, you know, portraits or caricatures you've done, what would it, what ballpark would it be in? Holy moly, I, I'm not sure, but I will say, again, coming back to being having been a lawyer and having been an academic or having been in an academic world, I'm quite disciplined and thorough, and. One aspect that in my art is that I take a photo of every single piece I do, wow. by and large. Not every single little sketch, but every single portrait that's finished or what have you is put on my Flickr account. And my thought is that that in itself is a work of art. Absolutely. And then I'm documenting each is a little brick in a bigger piece of art. And then, oh, this is so, I don't want to sound so pompous, but I think James Joyce said that his goal in life was to create a body of work that would keep academics and writers thinking for millennia. Mm. So I do, I do have a wee bit of that in, 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 in mind that, that maybe people can, will be able to look back and see mm-hmm. the evolution. Cause if you look at my work from like 2014, from when I was sitting drawn in a John Hewitt with one of Jerry's beautiful pints of Guinness, uh, <laughs> <laughs> like it, I, all, I sort of like, I like shudder at how I sort of, primitive and appalling <laughs> mate i think any anyone who creates something can relate to that yeah, they can yeah. relate to the kind of almost the embarrassment but also the the real sense of momentum like i think you know something i say all the time to people if you go back and you listen to my first you know i i would even say my first 50 podcasts yeah I'm a bit scundered. Yeah, like yeah. I'm not even a bit. I'm really scundered by yeah. them. I'm like, I hate the way I sound. And yeah. oh, why did you do that? And why did you not do this? And why is it edited like that? Or why did yeah. you try to take the conversation down that? But at the same time, it is really empowering to look back on a body of work yeah. that you know grows over time and people can engage with in some sort of a way, like yeah. you know, for years to come. And I think 
a lot of people who you know are the lawyers or are the nine to five office worker they you know they really miss out on having that sort of portfolio because mm. um, even henry like we were you know we were saying this bfg drawn that you've done yeah uh, you know, it's the second time you've done it. You can look back on the first one and see how much better you've got already. Yeah. Yeah. And you know that's that's encouraging. There's something really exciting about that. Yeah. There's a the C.S. Lewis quote for that is like you know, day by day nothing changes. Then I look back and all has changed. Wow. Or something to that effect. And when it's it's the same. I remember trying to learn a guitar. Um. When when you first do something, you've no frame of reference. So it feels like it's impossible. Mm. But if you can actually, if you get the grade, I, I didn't even do my grades, but I imagine you, once you get the grade five, six, seven, and you suddenly you've got a frame of reference, you can see where you've come from, where, you have a sense of where you're going. Yeah. And that generates its own momentum. So that's what like encourages me more than anything, any other artist. I'm sure when, when you get to see evolution, when you look back in your year's worth or Facebook does a thing like this happened to you. <laughs> you look back, yeah, the time you know, hop, the artistic time hop. Yeah. Because yeah. you don't, like, you don't, it's that C.S. Lewis thing. You don't get better in the days or weeks. It's but months. There's like a silent mm-hmm. process going on within you. So that's as you as you're sort of saying of yourself. Even you've seen a growth. You know your first fifty episodes. You look back and you you want to scrub out from history. In five years' time, you may say the the same. Like, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right now, exactly. But you're kind of content with right now. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um. This is a harder exercise, I suppose, but you do, and I know you, you kind of have a bit of, um, I don't know if angst is the right word about the 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 years that you spent not pursuing art, mm-hmm. but at the same time, you also are really privileged because you are still young and you have, yeah. you know, a yeah. whole career at kind of ahead of you and a whole craft yeah. to pursue. What do you, what sort of things do you want to move into over the next few decades um, are there any areas you want to really grow? Is there anything that you even want to tangibly achieve or do in your kind of creative endeavor? Um, yeah, as I said, my first love was rugby, and I'm looking around myself and all these like are, are these rugby players who I envy greatly are now <laughs> retiring. Yeah, you know, Chris Henry and Andrew Trimble. Where's an, an artist when you, when when they're retiring? You're only getting started. Mm. And I think the Chinese say, like, you know, art's a, an old man or a woman's game. So, yeah, it's incredibly exciting knowing that you can be, like, Baza Blackshaw and painting in your 80s and 90s. Picasso was watching it last night. He died in his 90s and he was pa- painting right up to the end. The same with Brian Ballard, another local artist. I think he's in his 80s. Wow. Um, he's pumping it out. So, uh, yeah, it's incredibly exciting. Um, but in terms of what I want to achieve, I, just, I want to be able to do what Sir John Lavery did and just do images that are burnt on to people's minds or the, the way Colin Davidson, his images of uh, Duke Special or who, who, what have you, people all recognize his work. Mm. And Sir John Lavery, he, he, he sort of did the painting of uh, the Twelfth and Porter Down. And it's a lot, well, a lot of people would know it and that got me doing that. So that's, that's what I would do now. I would, I would every 12th of July, I'm booked in, I don't think it's going to happen this year, but it's supposed to be in Limavati. Last year they had me at Ballon Hens, so I'm I'm known f- I'm known f- for that in small circles, but and the, the work is good, but it's not amazing. But mm. I'm excited to see what it's going to be like in twenty, thirty years time. Yeah, exactly. I'm committed to doing that. And then of course I I, I, I paint rugby matches, um, which I got from the French. They they do that. Um, painting the horses. Um. Uh. So and I just want to be able to do th- like this portrait I'm doing of you now. I want to be able to. Do big Colin Davidson style ones. Mm. Like there's there's one of Heaney over there. It's it's huge, big, yeah, human sized frame, and I did it, and then I changed it, and I don't like it. Yeah, it might take another two or three years until it's done right. Yeah, but I want to get there, and that's like sort of goal. So there's a few questions that I ask every single person that we've the chance of interviewing, and you can jump in on some of these too, Henry, wherever you want. Yeah. Uh, the first one's a hard one. Okay, the first one is out of all your experience so far, what has been the most difficult or the most challenging thing that you've had to walk through? Oh, definitely those twilight days and years. Just, 
I have fared well in the institution of like you know primary school and secondary school. I was a cast adrift at university. So, and then those days after when I wasn't able to find a job, and the brutal like grievous assaults on my like self esteem <laughs> from the um, from the the recruitment agencies and that the, grammar schools of self esteem like. <laughs> Yeah, did you bleeding. find? Did you um, have mum's um, girlfriend when you when you got before you got a job, or did you have a job before you had her? Well, yeah, I had yeah, and uh, soothe these gaping wounds. Yeah, the because you can get your lunch or something. <laughs> I certainly can get my lunch. <laughs> That's them. why you need her first. Yeah, so yeah, no, the answer the whole time. Delivery exists in those de- de- no. in that. Certainly did not exist in 2011, 12, I don't think. But yeah, those, those were challenging times. Was there anything like that? Probably yeah. not. Probably just like independent takeaways doing their own delivery. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, and but but I, I kind of kept kept it going. And yeah, so it's, it's, it's nice to look back on it now. But at the time, it was very, very, cho- those were choppy, it was in choppy waters. Mm-hmm. What would you say got you through that? Yeah, uh, good question. Um, because what? I, see, it's as as I'm talking to you now, and you're ta- telling me more about your writing, and I didn't know where I was going. I didn't know what we'd be doing this, but I suppose I just kept the faith of of, of hard work. Um, because de- definitely grammar school and university sort of dulled the senses in terms of. It's not about just getting the right grades it's about demonstrating wit and common sense and the hustle and entrepreneurial skills um which brings me back to where Arba Henry it's not about grades you know and that that I, I can really hamstring uh some some people and certainly did for me yeah so I've, I've learned that lesson hopefully going to try to pass that on it's cool Henry, what do you think is the hardest thing you've ever done? Well, the hardest thing I've ever done. It'll be a hard one. What walked that full length of Bush Mills the other day, remember? It took like three hours, didn't it? Three ages, yeah. <laughs> well, wow. One of the big things that I, I, I've really enjoyed seeing him do is he's getting really good spelling. Oh, yeah? Because I, I, I don't know, again, people might not agree with me on this, but like it's just been frustrating watching him struggle with spellings. And the whole system's taught that, like, oh, sound it out. Yeah. Sound, okay, well, bear is spelt the same as here. <laughs> so the bear, and you find the wood, should we pronounce it beer? Or, you know, <laughs> fork and work. Yeah. So we spent the last sort of this whole um, lockdown, like, just drilling. The way the way they did in the good old days when I was educated, when we had blackboards and whiteboards, and he learned it. <laughs> so um, you know he's learning all these words like how to spell beaver or where, where we live. It's not spelt the way it sounds. Yeah, or it's not, it doesn't sound the way. B l v y r. Boom, nailed it. Um, there's like color. I spell color. C o l o u r. Well done. Boom. There's a couple. There's one or two other tricky ones that I've sort of been working with on no one, and. It's amazing. Like I learned this from doing French. You t- you, if you sort of just run, run it throughout the day, and then you say it before bed, you wake up, and it's boom, magically mm-hmm. in your head. Yeah. That's in Henry's. Yeah. So that's right. I don't know. I'm speaking maybe a wee bit for him, but like it's incredible. So if you hear this, that will be. If you want to tell your kids that, you can just do that. Tell them in the night, in the afternoon, in the morning. Yeah. And just well, wake up. And it's in there. And boom. Yeah, that it's was right there under your barber hat. It's just sitting there. Yeah, we, 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 we learned how to... It was when we were doing... When we went on that walk around the causeway. Yeah. That's what we'll do. We'll do the spelling. So I taught him how to spell causeway. And it's kind of hard. Yeah, it is hard. Causeway. C-A-U-S-E-W-A-Y. Boom. Class. That's sort of easy now. Sort of a bigger question then for you, Brian. Like... What sort of, like, you know, I loved how you kind of opened the episode talking about, uh, you know, back in the day, like men hanging out with men and smoking pipes and, you know, doing all this sort of stuff. Uh, What sort of 
legacy or what sort of things are you trying to instill in Henry at this kind of early Dad, stage of his signed? life? You know, some of these early <laughs> memories. Are they signed? Um... There you go, you are like an assistant mate. Stuff's being <laughs> sold all around us and Henry's making sure, did you sign that one, Dad? Is that one all good? Is that one ready to go? <laughs> well, Henry, Henry's a great wee studio assistant. Um, yeah, well, my dad used to smoke in the car every day. Yeah. <laughs> He'd smoke the whole two hours of the Bushmills and that put me off smoking forever. Bushmills isn't two hours, it's like one hour, I know, but back in the day. and the, no, no more Cars weren't stuff. as fast, roads weren't as good. Um, uh, used to give me banging migraine. But I did appreciate the aroma of the pipe and the cigar. Um, and my wife doesn't allow me to smoke near him. But at the same time, if it's outside and a bit of smoke wafts over him, hopefully that'll be a, 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 an aroma that yeah. will remind him of his childhood. Um, just to, just for Henry to um, have a good childhood um, and for, for me to pack it full of flavour and colour. Mm. Um, oh, you want to see the paintings? Maybe I, I, is there any way that we can show them some of Henry's art? Totally, mate. If you send me photos, yeah. I'll stick it on the web page. Just that, like I remember wrestling with, with Liam, my wife, about this. She was she was giving off a wee bit that was cluttering his room. And I was like, <laughs> but allow him to like he can curate. It. She was like, but I, I want to paint that wall in your hammer and stuff. Yeah. And I'm like, well, he can paint his own wall with his yeah. own art, and. Um, so his his whole his whole bedroom is just sort of like all, all his art. That's class. Um, like and then his sister's bedroom. Cause she loves Peppa Pig. He's done this, huge, this beautiful big painting of like what do you call the giraffe pig or the giraffe? Giraffe. 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 He did this huge big painting of giraffe. giraffe. It's like this <laughs> it's like on on the landing wall. He's done this huge big one of yeah yeah unbelievable. Yeah, he's 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 um he's done this huge big painting of the BFG doing uh, with his net running and I, I found a frame and a skip and put it in it for him so just showing him what can be done helping him along but then allowing him to take take charge and do it himself mm. um, you know I don't have a tattoo on my body but some for someone how he, 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 he got in his head he liked tattoos and got a tattoo drawn book you know when he's 14 or 15 and he'll spend all these years getting better at art and he still want it, wants to get into that by all means, I'll buy him a tattoo kit and a yeah. skin and I set him up with a PayPal account. <laughs> so just trying to like, yeah, he we do. He does a bit of rugby and does a bit of boxing, does a bit of art, and he goes fishing and we what we we eat sushi on a Friday and mm. um, he lifts boxes up the stairs. <laughs> um, just trying to, yeah, that's awesome. Um, one of the other kind of questions I, I'm always interested in, like, so far, what do you Look at as the most successful moment. Um, I suppose you're supposed to say like you know your, your children and stuff, but um, that just being able to turn that ship round from those sort of like being cast adrift days to something that's now um competent and upright and going forward and being able to look after a family. Yeah, there's nothing like that. Being able to. Uh, uh, like my dad, my dad. I remember when we had the christening for Mary Kate, and I think it was like three hundred pounds for the hospitality. Yeah, and he wanted to pay for it, but it just felt so good being able to pay for it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. As I, as I was touching on earlier, um, I was a wee bit hamstrung maybe by the, the concept that if you just get an A at A level and a mm. two two or two or sorry two one. But that's it. That's all. And that's, yeah. That's you all will go well for you in life. <laughs> yeah, and. There, um, that's not true and there's something as I said those twilight years there's something incredibly um, uh, uh, just not being able to look after yourself or not being able to like earn money or pay for things mm. so yeah just being able to like make this work and to be able to like stand upright and to be able to like my, my parents my dad's like in his 70s mum's in their 60s and they're in lockdown to be able to bring them a coffee mm-hmm. on a Friday, take away coffee. And I always joke, like, Dad, I'd love to see... Like, my, da- my dad's dad was born in, like, 1908. I was always joke him and said, like, Dad, I would, would love to have seen you doing this. <laughs> bring bringing Fred a, a, t- a lovely takeaway cappuccino. Yeah. So we, we think it's like that. Or he, he, he was... Um, I'm 32-year-old. Why am I saying this? But, like, just... He, he was looking like an armchair or something for sitting out in the sun. We were able to buy him that. Yeah. Things like that are really cool. 
<laughs> got, a, got a barber jacket too. <laughs> um, so, yes, yeah, so that, that's the most satisfying thing. That's you know, cool. Being able to look after Henry, the family, and get, be able to get my dad back after all these years. That's great. Totally. Here, Henry, hop on the mic there for a second. I have three really fast questions, okay? Mm-hmm. First one is, what's your favorite takeaway? Favorite takeaway? Pizza, probably. What type of pizza? Pepperoni or cheese, I don't mind it. Mm. Or ham and cheese. What's your... Or ham and mushroom. What's your favorite type of ice cream? Probably chocolate or... You can sometimes get like Nutella ice cream. Mm. Yeah, those, uh, I like them. Do you have a favorite place to go for ice cream? What? Do you have a favorite place to buy ice cream? You know that new place, place called Azulado? Yeah. <laughs> you know that, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's sweet, isn't it? Yeah. They do good Nutella ice cream there, I'll tell you that. Yeah. What would you, Brian, um, if you could take anyone from Northern Ireland dead or alive out for coffee, oh. who'd you take? Where'd you take them? Oh. You know who. Uh, you know, you're talking about different strands of art. One strand that I really want to get into is like street art. I really, really want to do a mural. And I'll give a shout out if anyone wants to make this happen. That's awesome. Someone like Mike Gibson. I didn't really appreciate who he was. You probably don't. I'm not putting it down or <laughs> most of your listeners don't. Sure. Apparently, he, and I'm saying this apparently because I had to read this to find out. Apparently, Mike Gibson was like the rugby player's rugby player. Wow. In the 70s and 80s. And he went in like numerous Lions tours. Like the, the, the top dogs were saying he was like the just out of this world in terms of his strength and his stamina and his brain. Um, and he's practicing law around the corner. It's we crazy. Probably walk past him or being in with his proximity, but nobody knows him. He's a very humble guy, so I'd love to sit with him. But the other thing is, you need to get his image. He's, he went to Campbell. He's from East Belfast, still lives in or I think, I think he lives out towards Bangor somewhere. But um, those words that were, were written, that you know, basically saying, I can't remember what the word, but he was the man. Hmm. So, yeah, Mike Gibson. Um, and, yeah, John Lavery. That's cool. Um, final question. I don't know if you're able to answer this because you haven't got there yet, Henry, but the question that we uh, always end the episodes on is if you could go back in time, Brian, to an 18-year-old version of yourself and uh, you had a few minutes of uh, 18-year-old Brian's time, what sort of advice would you give him? You know, I, I had a good time, fun, and I, and I hung around, did different things, but yeah, just don't be so complacent. You know, realize that no one's going to do anything for you. Um, and just getting the grades isn't enough. You need to sort of really switch on, read, and get everything done. So, yeah. It's awesome. Well, here, Noah, really, really appreciate your time. And uh, it's good to see the setup, good to see the hustle and the bustle, and things literally flying off the shelves and things <laughs> being sold all around us. And uh background noises and henry drawn and everything it was absolutely awesome so you no. looking forward to seeing your portrait yeah i actually am how far along are you not we're nowhere near as far along as i would have hoped <laughs> been. but yeah no it, it, we're, we're not that far off that's cool um i, f- I feel like i'm because uh, of lockdown i haven't been as i haven't been doing these portraits Nages. in quite a while so you go rusty that should be no no yeah, no excuse. Just look like really like well the shape of the head isn't that right? Yeah, but it'll get it right. So oh, the nose is like a wee bit longer. I see the way it's meant to be like here. Yeah, cool. Thanks for having us do that. No, mate. Thanks for hosting me. I really appreciate it. Really unique experience. I was very lucky getting to do something like that. Unreal. Well. Uh, thank you very much for listening I really appreciate you uh, spending time with us and hanging out here in the studio and getting to know Brian getting to know Henry Uh, hope you enjoyed it as much as I did it was really really interesting and uh, sure like we were kind of saying if you'd like to check out some of the other interviews that Brian was mentioning you can head to bestbelfast.org there's over 150 um, very relaxed very casual chats just like the one you've heard here today uh, with incredible people from Northern Ireland who are doing really interesting things. And so other than that, just want to say thanks again. 
and uh look forward to catching you next time cheers <laughs>